Hi there. You're listening to The Hellenistic Age Podcast. Episode 40, Carthage, The Forgotten Mediterranean Empire. Let there be no love between our peoples and no treaties. Arise from my dead bones, O my unknown avenger, and harry the race of Dardanus with fire and sword whenever our strength allows it. I pray that we may stand opposed, shore against shore, sea against sea, and sword against sword. Let there be war between the nations and between their sons forever. So says Queen Dido of Carthage in Book 4 of the Latin epic The Aeneid, composed by the Roman poet Virgil in the late 1st century BC. From these lines, spoken by a lovesick and vengeful Dido against Aeneas, the Trojan refugee who would become the ancestor of the founders of Rome, Virgil retroactively paints the monumental struggle between the Roman Republic and the Phoenician city-state of Carthage as inevitable, over a century after the city was systematically destroyed by Roman forces in 146 BC. But for nearly 700 years, Carthage and its peoples would be a major player in the central and western Mediterranean, famous for their shipbuilding and navigation in pursuit of trade and colonization that would leave a mark in both their home of North Africa and the likes of Spain, Sicily, and Sardinia. In this episode, we are going to take a brief look at the early history of Carthage, along with analysis of its institutions, so as to better understand this civilization that is often merely seen as Rome's first great imperial rival. As a brief aside, I wanted to mention that I created an Amazon book wishlist page for the podcast. If you were thinking about donating to the show, but wanted to directly see the contribution go back into production, perhaps you can check out my list of books that I'm looking to acquire for research purposes. So, if you're interested, check out the link in the show notes or on the front page of my website. Now, back to the program. Putting together a complete picture of Carthage remains a great challenge to modern scholars. Although the Carthaginians and more famously the Phoenicians, had their own alphabet and system of writing, the vast majority of materials related to them come from non-Carthaginian sources, more specifically the Greeks and Romans. While we have deciphered a fair amount of inscriptions and unorthodox sources written in Phoenician, or the Western dialect classified as Punic, there is almost nothing accounted for in regards to a Carthaginian equivalent of Herodotus or Livy. There certainly is proof that the Carthaginians did produce works of history and technical treatises, most famously the agricultural manual authored by one Mago that was preserved by later Roman authors, but none have survived to the modern day, whether out of lack of interest or an explicit scrubbing by the Romans during their sack of the city, though this latter interpretation is doubtful, given King Macipsa of Numidia seized the contents of Carthage's library during said sack. The most prominent accounts of Carthage are in regards to their conflicts with Magna Graecia and the Roman Republic, authors such as Diodorus Siculus, Polybius, and Livy dominating the narrative with relatively little focus on the inner workings of Carthage itself. All of these accounts are biased to some extent, largely written from the point of view of the earlier Greek or Roman historians who either did not have access to Carthaginian sources or would lean upon sources who were anti-Carthaginian in nature. This is not to say that this was entirely the case. There were earlier Greek historians and writers relied upon by Polybius that were explicitly pro-Carthaginian, such as Sosilus of Sparta and Silenus Calatinus, both of whom were contemporaries of Hannibal Barca in the Second Punic War, along with Philenus of Acragas, who wrote a pro-Carthaginian history of the First Punic War. Understanding the sources is important, largely because we need to understand what we mean when we say Punic or Carthaginian. Identifying strict ethnic or cultural boundaries when it comes to the peoples of the ancient world remains sketchy at best, and the lack of Carthaginian sources do not help. Traditionally, the Carthaginians are listed among a larger group of peoples known as the Phoenicians, a name itself derived from the Greek word phoenikes, or phoenix. This term was later co-opted by the Latin-speaking peoples of Italy to become Poinus, and then Punic, which is more commonly used to describe the Carthaginians rather than the Eastern Phoenicians. This wasn't always the case, but for the sake of the podcast, when I say Punic, it is in reference to the Carthaginians. The geographic origin of the Phoenicians is usually listed as belonging on the Levantine coast, in an area sometimes labeled as Phoenicia, roughly modern Lebanon and southwestern Syria. 
This is the biblical Canaan, and it is believed that the Phoenicians would refer to themselves as Canaanites, or Canai, in their own tongue. Phoenician itself is a Semitic language, sharing close ties with the biblical Hebrew, and its application for writing would lead to the development of the Phoenician alphabet, an important milestone as it would form the basis of the Greek, Etruscan, and Latin alphabets, which in turn make their appearance in the Romance and Germanic languages, including English. While there may have been a general sense of shared identity among the Phoenicians, they most likely chose to represent themselves as belonging to a particular city or region, rather than a broader ethno-geographic term like Phoenician or Canaanite. Major Phoenician cities included Tyre, Sidon, and Byblos, and they emerged as powerful and prosperous centers during the collapse of the late Bronze Age civilizations around the 12th century BC, and were famous for their wealth. The dye made from the crushed murex sea snails commonly is called Tyrian purple, which was actually more of a scarlet color, and it was prized by royal figures and nobility throughout antiquity, and their mastery of all things nautical allowed them to establish great trading routes across the Mediterranean, though this wealth soon gave the Phoenicians a reputation as being greedy, a stereotyping which we will talk about later in this episode. What would be known as Carthage, Karthadasht in Phoenician, meaning new city, would be founded in roughly the late 9th century BC along the coast of modern Tunisia in the Gulf of Tunis. It was the culmination of Phoenician colonization efforts, though they might not have known it at the time, as many other settlements across the Mediterranean have been set up with considerable success, like nearby Utica or Gades, the site of modern Cadiz in southern Spain. Various explanations have been put forth as to why such a venture was sent out from the mother city of Tyre in southern Lebanon. Economic opportunities, overpopulation, and political turmoil from both internal dissent and the military threat of the burgeoning Neo-Assyrian Empire. It was explicitly a colony. Its position located in a natural port, and the surrounding countryside was fertile for farming, and it would soon eclipse its predecessor as the greatest Phoenician city. The exact date of the foundation is controversial, as attempts by ancient authors result in various myths and stories. The writer Justin puts forth a tale about a Tyrian queen named Elisa, Elishat in Phoenician, escaping the devious intentions of her brother Pygmalion, who murdered her husband in an effort to claim the kingship of Tyre. Once she landed upon the shores of what would become Carthage, she laid out her city, which immediately became prosperous under her leadership before attracting the attention of a neighboring North African king. When coerced to marry this king by her counselors, she took it upon herself to trick the Carthaginians into building a sacrificial pyre for good luck, and then promptly proceeded to throw herself upon it while plunging a dagger into her chest. This is perhaps the most likely tale we are given by the ancient authors, and it is the one most believed by the Greco-Roman world, as elements seem to be lifted straight out of the story by Virgil, changing Elisa into Dido, and changing her cause of death as due to her infatuation with Aeneas. Along with the lost history of Menander of Ephesus and Timaeus of Syracuse, Justin's epitome also offers the traditional date of the foundation at roughly 814 BC, give or take a few years. And given the range pushed by other ancient authors going from the 1230s to the 700s, it certainly is closer to the archaeological record, which suggests habitation by the late 9th, early 8th century. The early history of Carthage remains sketchy. The city itself was nicely positioned as a natural hub for trading routes across the Mediterranean, and soon considerable wealth poured in, allowing the limits of the colony to grow and become highly developed, numbering around 30,000 people within a century of its foundation. The land surrounding Carthage itself was remarkably productive, which may seem unusual based upon the perception of modern North Africa as being mostly desert. But ancient North Africa was an economic powerhouse with a far more amenable climate for agriculture until at least late antiquity. This prosperity naturally attracted outside groups, mainly the indigenous tribal peoples known collectively as the Numidians and the Libyans, who are classified as belonging to an ethnic group known as the Berbers. The Numidians were of a nomadic way of life, famous in antiquity for their excellent horsemanship and their later kings like Massinissa and Jugurtha, and the Libyans themselves were also prominent as excellent warriors in Greek histories and mythology. Trade and exchange would soon bring these people into close proximity, 
and there are reports that the Carthaginians had to pay some form of tribute to the local Libyan chieftains, perhaps to serve as mercenaries for the city's protection and or dissuade them from pillaging the countryside. Gradually, as Carthage's power and prestige grew, they soon ceased these payments and began to subdue the tribes, either by conquering them outright or by turning them into vassals or allies. Though suspicion and hostilities would periodically emerge between the disparate groups, there was a definite exchange in visual arts and culture, as the Carthaginians and native communities engaged in trade and intermarriage, the most famous example being the tragic marriage of King Masinissa to the Carthaginian noblewoman Sophonisba. The Numidians in particular would provide Carthage's army with some of the finest cavalry in the Mediterranean world, a relationship that, once severed by interference from the Romans, would prove to have far-reaching consequences. Like their Tyrian forebears, the Carthaginians were equally capable of sending up their own colonies and expeditions, both across the sea into places like Spain and Sicily, and into the countryside of Africa. One of the keys to the success of the Carthaginians and the Phoenicians as a whole was their knowledge of ship design and sailing ability. In the 4th century, the Carthaginians are credited for coming up with the design of the quadrireme, a ship that utilized two pairs of rowers on each oar to move it, which quickly replaced the classical trireme as the naval vessel of choice, and the later quincareme was modified by the Carthaginians as well. According to Polybius, the Romans were able to catch up to the Carthaginians in sailing technology by copying and modifying the design of a Punic warship, washed up intact upon the beach. But what was also possible was that they were able to adapt the Carthaginians' ingenious method of ship production. Shipwrecks off the coast of Marsala have turned up Carthaginian sailing vessels, and at least one of these ships had the individual planks each labeled with their own unique symbol for easy placement during construction, which suggests that Carthaginian shipbuilding was similar in function to assembling furniture from Ikea or building model airplanes in terms of convenience. This mastery of all things nautical allowed them to cross and dominate the Mediterranean Sea, giving them unprecedented access to the trade routes all over Europe, North Africa, the Near East, and sometimes beyond. One of the most well-attested to Carthaginian explorers was Hanno the Navigator, who sailed through the Straits of Gibraltar into the Atlantic Ocean, traveling south along the coast of Western Africa until he eventually hit what is thought to be modern Gabon, where he allegedly met hairy tribesmen and women, and managed to take some of their skins back to Carthage, leading some to think he encountered gorillas or chimpanzees, though the wild ape angle is considered questionable according to most historians. Hanno had his tail set in an inscription, and it was apparently translated and preserved in its entirety by a Greek copyist. And while there are some inconsistencies in the geography, most believe the story is truthful, and is a testament to the navigational talent of the Carthaginians. The city of Carthage itself was a bustling metropolis, perhaps 300,000 residents at its peak. Its outer walls were heavily fortified. Great moats lined the outside to deter siege equipment, and the adjacent access to the sea which they controlled with their powerful navy meant that besieging the city would prove to be a daunting venture. The city aesthetics were designed with various cultural influences in mind, Near Eastern, Egyptian, Greek, leading some to disparagingly classify it as a tacky hodgepodge of contrasting elements, though others might suggest there is a certain grace and elegance to the detailed ornaments and sculptures that decorated the landscape. One of the most famous features of the city itself was its two enclosed artificial harbors, collectively known as a Cothon, constructed in its later years during the interval between the Second and Third Punic War. The Cothon was comprised of a dugout canal connecting the city to the Gulf of Tunis. The entrance was about half a kilometer in width, which could be gated by the use of a large iron chain, which led to the commercial harbor serving as a shipyard for merchant vessels. Past the first harbor was the military harbor, but instead of a rectangular shape, it was a circular or hexagonal one, with an artificial island placed in the center. This shape allowed for the most effective use of surface area to place the covered docks, comfortably allowing 170 war vessels to be placed on the outside rim, and another 140 along the rim of the island itself. If you go to the show notes for this episode on my website, you'll find a reconstruction of the harbor, among many other helpful images, so I very much encourage you to do so. The wealth of Carthage was almost entirely due to her status as one of the premier mercantile centers of the ancient world, especially after the submission of Tyre to the Babylonian ruler Nebuchadnezzar II in 573, 
which meant that the mother city no longer held the same level of prominence in trading. Some of the exports that Carthage could provide to the Mediterranean world included Tyrian purple dye, whose production centers would definitely have been stuck somewhere on the outskirts of the city, given its horrendous stench due to the rotting remains of crushed up sea snails. Less smelly wares included various African goods, such as ostrich feathers and ivory, another type of wine known as Libyan wine, and especially grain. The extent of the trade was aided by Carthage's position in the network of roads that linked across the Mediterranean, and during its later stages, the Kothan also encouraged outside visitors to stop by. Let us briefly move away from Carthage's history, and instead turn to analyzing the internal structure of their maritime empire, and to answer what some might call a burning question regarding Punic religion. With Carthage's domination of the sea, and the expansion of Punic colonies across the Mediterranean, some would classify Carthage as an empire, exerting considerable political and cultural influence over North Africa, southern Spain, Sardinia, and eastern Sicily by the 4th century BC. Though the exact definition of empire is a bit finicky, Carthage's government was essentially a republic, with oligarchic or aristocratic elements, similar to the structure of the Roman Republic. Much of Carthage's early history would revolve around a monarchy, which is poorly documented, but the kingship would eventually give way to republicanism by the early 5th century BC. Our understanding of its inner workings are limited, but Aristotle in the mid-4th century analyzed the Carthaginian constitution, considering it a solid form of government overall, though his interpretations are very Greek in nature, as to better relate it to his audience. At the top of the government were three powerful groups. The first were the Sufetes, the Latin word for shopetim, which approximately translates to judges or magistrates, though the Greeks sometimes mislabeled them as being kings. These were an annually elected pair of officials, akin to the Roman consuls, who were the senior authority on important matters for the city's domestic and foreign policies. Considerable wealth and prestige were required to become a Sufete, and while it was an hereditary position, a number of families in Carthaginian history would dominate the political scene by its manipulation, such as the Maganids of the 6th and 5th century, or the Barkids of the 3rd and 2nd. The second group is known as the Adirim, also known as the Carthaginian Senate, who debated on matters military, economical, and political. One of the checks and balances of the system required that the members of the Senate would have to come to terms with the Sufetes, but in return, the Sufetes needed to consult the Senate on important matters. Then there is the 104, a council of 104 elder Carthaginians, reportedly chosen by merit, that act as an independent arbitrator on the military to see if they were following the best interests of Carthage. Being a general under investigation by the 104 must have been a terrifying prospect, as the Carthaginians had a proclivity to crucifying their generals should they fail their missions or be convicted of corruption. It must be understood that all of these elements varied in importance and appear more prominently at different times, but I just wanted to give an overall impression on the government structure. While these may be the ones ruling at the top of Carthage, aristocratic or not, they were still a republic, and were subject to what is simply called the people, meaning the voting body of Carthaginian citizens. Citizenship in Carthage was not a universal right, as it is suggested that there were various degrees depending on some sort of qualifier, perhaps genealogical in nature, as the union of Carthaginian and Libyan couples known to the Greeks as Libby Phoenicians were given some degree of rights. It was exclusive to males, with the wealthy being given preferential treatment, and it must be mentioned that Carthaginian and Phoenician women in general are largely absent in our sources, though it is curious that the tradition of a female founder of Carthage is consistent across a number of authors. Colonists did not have the same rights as Carthaginian citizens, but were given a degree of flexibility and independence in terms of self-governance, though they were required to pay tribute to the mother city if they wanted the protection of the Carthaginian navy. The citizens themselves had little power, which seems to have created resentment among the poorer classes of the Carthaginians, but they would be able to gather together to vote on issues between the Senate and the Sufetes if those two bodies could not come to an agreement. 
To compensate for their lack of individual input, there seems to be an indication that the Carthaginian citizens would be grouped into something akin to guilds or associations. These associations are built on a wide array of identities, such as the type of craftsman you were, what particular deity you worshipped, or whether you were a military veteran or not. The members would frequently meet together to have feasts and banquets, and the associations themselves would advance the political interests of their members in the Carthaginian Senate, while the associates would be able to continue working. One major difference between the Greek and Roman demands of citizenship with that of the Carthaginians was that there was no required military service. A point must be brought up though. Polybius claims that the Carthaginians relied exclusively on mercenary forces when it came to their land armies, but that citizens were more present in the navy. This is only partially true, as the Carthaginians did tend to have higher rates of enrollment of citizens in their naval forces, but there certainly were citizens in the land army. The most famous example is what is known as the Sacred Band, a professional or semi-professional unit comprised entirely of wealthy Carthaginian citizens, which appeared in the 4th century holding its own against the armies of Timoleon and Agathocles of Syracuse. It is fair to say though that their armies were heavily bolstered by non-Carthaginian troops, both mercenaries and allied forces, most prominently from neighboring Libyan tribes, prized Numidian cavalry, Celtiberians and Gallic auxiliaries, but they would also sometimes recruit Greeks and Italians. The Carthaginian infantry was equipped in the hoplite panoply, basing their tactics on the phalanx, while the various other allied and mercenary contingencies would fight in their own native styles. To supplement these men, the armies included cavalry in the form of horsemen and chariots, ranged troops such as javelinmen and Beliaric slingers, a people famous for their tradition for stone slinging since a young age, and, most famously, war elephants. Part of the disdain that Polybius seems to express for the land army's apparent lack of a citizen body was that Carthage itself did not experience warfare on its home territory to any major extent. Most of their conflicts were abroad, particularly in Sicily throughout the 5th and 4th centuries, and it would be Agathocles, who invaded North Africa in the 310s, that proved Carthage could be challenged on their home turf. Subsequently, the Carthaginians would deal with a number of major wars at home on a hitherto unknown scale throughout the 3rd and 2nd centuries, mainly the Three Punic Wars. And when the city itself was in trouble, citizen levies would be frequently raised. But in fairness to Polybius, Carthage itself underwent an existential crisis after the First Punic War, due to the abundance of mercenaries they brought in to serve them, and led to the appropriately named Mercenary War, that ravaged the North African countryside for over two years. Regardless of whether they were citizens or were mercenaries, Carthage was easily the largest military force in the Western Mediterranean, only surpassed by the Roman Republic, which still did not have the same level of dominance at sea. The commanders and generals that would lead the armies during the campaigns were recruited almost entirely from Carthaginian stock, though they would also commission outside officers, such as Xanthippus of Sparta, who would play an important role in the upcoming First Punic War. These commanding Carthaginians would be under heavy scrutiny by the likes of the Council of 104, who seemed to motivate their commanders by punishing them with crucifixion should they fail their objectives, shirk their duties, or go rogue. Given that many of their commanders were far and away from Carthage itself, it is not surprising that some of them would operate independently to some degree. The Second Punic War, while definitely sanctioned by the Carthaginian Senate, was definitely more of Hannibal Barca's war than a Carthaginian one, and in a number of instances we find Carthaginian commanders doing double dealing in Greek Sicily against the best interests of the home government. Moving to spiritual matters, the religious life of the Carthaginians was based around a number of deities. An important god of the city was Melkart, who was essentially a patron of colonization and a representation of the monarchy. While more revered in their mother city of Tyre, who ordered that every settlement founded by Tyrian descendants would require a temple dedicated to the god, Melkart was nevertheless honored in the Punic pantheon, and on at least one occasion, the Carthaginians sent about one-tenth of the city's revenues back to the original Tyrian sanctuary. Out of all the Phoenician and Punic gods, Melkart would resonate the most with the Greco-Roman world, becoming identified with the demigod Heracles. Contemporary Carthaginian depictions of Melkart on coins and statues indicate that they adopted several Greek motifs, including the club and lion skin, and Hannibal Barca is thought to have a special connection with Melkart as well. 
Alexander the Great, just prior to his great siege of Tyre in 332, is said to have attempted to offer sacrifice to Heracles Melkart during a festival, but was turned away on the account that the festival in question was a deeply private matter, meaning only Phoenicians were allowed. The leading figures of the Carthaginian pantheon was the god Balhaman and the goddess Tanit, often approximated as the Greek Zeus and Hera, or the Roman Jupiter and Juno. Balhaman was a regionalized aspect of the Phoenician Baal, which translates into something like Lord, and Tanit was a minor female deity that was transformed into the patroness of Carthage, replacing the prominence of the goddess Astarte in the traditional Phoenician pantheon. Tanit in particular is well depicted in Carthaginian art and inscriptions. Though the iconography is rather simple, an isosceles triangle with a circle at the tallest point and a line bisecting the two is signifying a woman with outstretched arms, perhaps a visual metaphor for her offering of fertility or for her enclosed protection of the city. Tanit's relevance was also apparent to outside observers, as the Romans believed that Juno was the protector goddess of the city, which forms the backbone of the conflict between the Trojan Ennius and the Carthaginian Dido in the early part of Virgil's Aeneid. The piety of the city's resonance is also apparent in the Carthaginians' naming system. Generally, the names are in relation to their gods. For example, Hannibal is the Hannobal, meaning Baal is gracious to me, and Baumokar being Bod Melkart, in service to Melkart. One of the frustrating things to anyone who reads about Carthaginian history to any extent is a disproportionate appearance of certain names in the historical record. There are a ridiculous number of Bamilcars, Hannibals, Hannos, and Hasdrubals at any particular period of time, and with little indication of who's who, we are often given only a pittance of assistance, such as being given the name of their father, i.e. Hanno, son of Gizgo. Certainly the most controversial element of Carthaginian religion, and perhaps of the Carthaginians as a whole, is child sacrifice and the Tophet. For decades, scholars swayed back and forth on the issue, many believing that such claims were Roman propaganda designed to blacken Carthage's reputation and justify her conquest, while some argue it was a misinterpretation of Carthaginian funerary practices. To give some background, the word Tophet is a carryover from the Book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament, which referred to a sacred enclosure outside of Jerusalem where Phoenicians apparently sacrificed male children. And this has been carried over to the Carthaginians, who worshipped in a very similar fashion to their forebears. Diodorus gives an account of the sacrifice performed when Agathocles of Syracuse invaded North Africa in the 310s, and the desperate Carthaginians sought to supplicate their god Balhaman. Allegedly, about 200 noble infants would be brought to a great flame upon a raised platform with a statue of Baal, whose arms and hands were outstretched as one would carry logs, but at a sloped angle. The thundering of drumbeats echoed as the children were placed into the arms of the deity, before rolling down the arms and hands into the fire, the music drowning out the screams of the victims as they perished, one after the other, as the parents and onlookers remained silent. A hellish scene to be sure, but is it backed up by any physical evidence? Well, the Tophet of Carthage has been excavated, located in the enclosed southern portion of the city, and a number of interesting results have turned up. Urns have been found containing the cremated remains of young children, numbering around five to six months. But the curious thing is that some of them have been mixed with the remains of other animals, and these particular infants have no indication that they died of anything beyond natural causes, something to be expected in a heavily populated city in the ancient world. These urns sometimes contain small trinkets, and one implication is made that the cremation was merely a method to deliver the infant to the afterlife, leading some individuals to believe that the Tophet was only a cemetery for the very young, from prenatal to early infancy. Some ancient societies did not view very young children as full human beings, possibly in part a coping mechanism to deal with the ravages of infant mortality, and it would explain the mixing of human and animal bones amongst the urns. This doesn't quite hold up when compared to other information as there are indications that a wider range of children have been found in this Tophet, including one six or seven year old, and the proportion of infants is no different than what is to be expected in similar sized cemeteries for the time. So the Tophet is not merely a misinterpreted funerary practice, but the most conclusive piece of evidence comes from an inscription dedicated at the Tophet that reads, quote, 
It was to the Lady Tanit, face of Baal, and to Baal Hamon that Balmokar, son of Hanno, grandson of Milkiathon, vowed this son of his own flesh, bless him you. End quote. The exact choice of words in the original Punic is indicative that the author was explicitly referring to his son as a sacrifice to the god, and appears to be a point of pride for the father in question. The specific designation, Hamon, is also theorized to be a derived Phoenician word, which would ultimately make Baal Hamon translate to Lord of the Furnaces. So, what can we conclude from this? In the opinion of most scholars, Human sacrifice was something that was definitely practiced by the Carthaginians. However, a caveat must be made. There is no indication that there was systematic practice of human sacrifice to the extent of the Aztec Empire of Mesoamerica, and from what evidence is suggested, this appears to have been done during times of extreme duress, when the city itself was under the threat of destruction. While I'm sure I don't have to clarify why the act itself is so abhorrent, Context must be made in regards to other contemporary societies. The Romans on more than one occasion practiced human sacrifice and desperation, once being after the defeat of Cannae in 216, when two male-female couples of Greek and Gallic origins were buried alive. Agamemnon famously sacrificed his daughter to ensure good sailing to Troy, though he was punished later on for this act. Ultimately, Carthaginian religious practices and beliefs were very similar to that of the Levantine Phoenicians, and there was a certain degree of pride when it came to representing their piety when presenting gifts back to Tyre's temples. However, as their needs and circumstances changed when settling in North Africa, so too did their worship. Without a monarchy, Melkart took a backseat role, whereas Tanit and Baal became more prominent. And in the inverse, the Carthaginians remained more conservative, continuing to practice human sacrifice when it fell out of favor back in the Levant. Interactions between the Carthaginians and the Phoenicians with the outside world is on record in the Greek sources since at least the time of Homer, who referred to Phoenician goods as being gifts of high status. Trade and exchange had certainly taken place between the peoples the Carthaginians came into contact with, such as the Celtiberians of Spain or the native peoples of North Africa. One particular region was Italy and Magna Graecia where the Celts, Etruscans, Latins, various Italians, and the Greek colonists formed a long connection from the north of Italy to Carthage itself. Each side influenced the other, the Carthaginians taking several architectural and artistic designs from Greece and the Etruscans, which is easily seen in their coinage, which fused Hellenistic or Hellenic-style casts with distinctively Punic elements, such as clothing, particular deities, and local flora and fauna. The army of Carthage, especially after the First Punic War, was modeled after hoplite warfare. There were also influences of Carthage on the Greco-Roman world. The adoption of quadrireams and modified quinqueremes quickly revolutionized naval warfare and sailing operations across the Mediterranean world, thanks to Carthage's naval ingenuity. Their ability to farm the sometimes daunting North African soil was translated into a practical application by the famous Carthaginian writer Mago, who penned a treatise on agriculture that was widely disseminated into the Roman world, and highly regarded by authors such as Pliny and Varro. As we have covered earlier, Aristotle considered the constitution of Carthage a very well-balanced system, putting it on the same pedestal as Greek polis like Sparta and Crete. Elements of Carthaginian and Phoenician religion had been recognized by Greek and Roman outsiders, most famously by Alexander the Great, wishing to pay homage to Melkart as Heracles, and there was perhaps evidence of either Tanit or Astarte influencing archaic Roman religion as well. We have a fair amount of evidence of long-distance relationships that go beyond merely economical. Records of marriages between Carthaginians and Greeks are attested to, with Agathocles of Syracuse possibly being of Punic descent on his mother's side and there were guest friendships between the Carthaginian and Greek families in Sicily. There were Greek immigrants to Carthage and took Carthaginian names, and the same is true with Carthaginians who migrated into Greeks in Italian cities. One famous example is Hadsdrubal, a Carthaginian citizen and philosopher who was of Greek descent that moved to Athens to lead the Platonic Academy in the late 2nd century. 
While this is something we are going to explore far more in depth once we discuss the First Punic War, the relationship between the Roman Republic and Carthage was surprisingly close-knit for hundreds of years, with multiple treaties being signed even in the face of outside aggression. An entire district of Rome itself was known as the Vicus Africus, a section of the city hosting a large amount of North African and Carthaginian traders. Of course, relationships are extremely complicated. And while there were large periods of peace between the Carthaginian and Greco-Roman worlds, mutual distrust and hostility would lead to the outbreak of warfare, most famously exemplified in the Punic Wars between the Romans and Carthaginians. From a basic level, the Carthaginians were frequently stereotyped as greedy and treacherous, never mind the accusations of systematic child sacrifice. An unfair assumption to make though it might be equally unfair to exclusively heap the blame on the Greeks and Romans for their stereotyping, for I am sure if we had the writings of Carthage on hand, those Punic authors would definitely have similar things to say about their rivals. In 480, the victory over Syracuse over the Carthaginian army at the Battle of Hemera had allowed for them to use it as propaganda and an attempt to add to the prestige in the eyes of their cousins on the Greek mainland. According to Syracusan tradition, the battle is to have taken place on the same day as the victory of Salamis, and they took the opportunity to accuse the Carthaginians of plotting with the Persian Empire, while absolving themselves of blame as to why they didn't send help to their mainland cousins. The intensity of warfare between the Greco-Roman world and Carthage would ramp up during the early period of the Hellenistic Age. Although they avoided the conquests of Alexander the Great, their cousins in Tyre would not be so lucky, and the city would brutally be sacked in 332 and the rest of Phoenicia would remain in Macedonian hands for the next 200 years. In the supposed last plans of Alexander, the king looked to eventually conquer the Carthaginian Empire on his way to the Pillars of Heracles, and Diodorus recounts how Carthaginian envoys who were in Tyre were let go by Alexander, with the warning that he would finish the job once he had conquered the Persian Empire. Skeptics suggest that this addendum might be a later Roman idea, in order to implicitly proclaim that they were able to do what Alexander could not. Tensions between the Greeks of Sicily and the Carthaginians culminated in an invasion of North Africa itself by the tyrant and king Agathocles of Syracuse in the 310s, and in the early 270s, another Greek adventurer by the name of Pyrrhus of Epiros had launched a campaign to conquer the Carthaginian portion of Sicily. Both were unsuccessful in their objectives, but by 275, it seemed that the greatest threat to Carthage would be from one of the Hellenistic powers, whether it was Syracuse, Ptolemaic Egypt, or any prospective mercenary commander looking to make off with the fertile lands of North Africa. As history has demonstrated, it would be the Romans, with whom the Carthaginians seemed to have the best relationship that would ultimately be the ones responsible for their city's downfall and destruction. To Rome, Carthage would become their greatest foe, represented by the boogeyman that was Hannibal Barca. In their eyes, defeating Carthage gave them enough confidence to take on the Hellenistic kingdoms and transform their humble city-state into a mighty empire. On a surface level, the sacking of Carthadasht in 146 BC wiped nearly 700 years of Punic civilization off the map. In some sense, this is correct given that we are bereft of written materials from the Carthaginians themselves, and the sheer dominance of Roman culture has made it challenging to detect any influence they may have made. In truth, pockets of Carthaginian culture and society would continue to survive the destruction of their city. Punic as a language would be spoken until the 9th century AD, including by the famous Christian thinker St. Augustine of Hippo, and the remains of Phoenician Carthage would serve as a culturally and economically vibrant region of the Roman Empire until the invasion of the Vandals in the 400s. Even some of the Roman emperors, the Severan dynasty of the late 2nd, early 3rd century AD, would be the descendants of Punic aristocrats. While we may be at the end of the episode and our discussion on Carthage, this doesn't mean that we are completely finished with them, not even close. We will spend plenty of time with the Carthaginians, both in upcoming and distant episodes, and I just wanted to give an overall impression of what they were like before we delved into the Punic Wars proper. If you're looking for any books to explore the Carthaginians in more detail, I would recommend either Carthage Must Be Destroyed by Richard Miles, or The Carthaginians, Peoples of the Ancient World by Dexter Hoyos, both of which I leaned heavily on while writing this episode, and are excellent reads in general. 
If you like this episode and want to hear more, consider subscribing to the show on the podcast platform of your choice. If you want to support the show, you can either donate to my coffee page or by my newly created Amazon wishlist. Or, barring that, you can easily leave a review if you're on iTunes or send me feedback by email or one of my many social media accounts. This episode's show notes include some helpful images and a full listing of my sources used. So, either click on the link in this episode description or by going to www.hellenisticagepodcast.wordpress.com. Next time we meet, we will be talking about Polybius, the Greek historian of the 2nd century BC, who was also known as the Thucydides of the Hellenistic Age. So, until then, you've been listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. <laughs>